thankful to be able to be with each and every one of you today. Thankful for what's been shared before us and what Elder Bobby uh, brought forward. Um, thoroughly enjoy that chapter of Psalms, chapter 37, has always been an encouragement to me and my family in times of trouble and um, has been a scripture that uh, Father in the ministry of mine has used to encourage me in times of, of hardships and whatever. And, and uh, I remember the statement when he shared it with me. He said, uh, do you believe it? Uh, yes, sir. Well, believe it and believe that God will do it. And I, I remember that thoroughly and I appreciate it. If you have your Bibles with you and you would like to turn with me, please turn with me over to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I'd like to draw our attention to that right there. I believe it does kind of flow in with what Brother Bobby brought forward there in, in Psalms chapter 37 when it talked about uh, the wicked will spread themselves as the green bay tree. It should be cut down and you won't be able to find it. It'll be no more. You ever cut a tree down and that tree is just gone and the, the stump rots away and sometimes it'll have a little sprout that likes to spring forward but usually when somebody cuts it on down and does away with it, it's done away. When God does something and he does it, it's done. When the Lord takes out the wicked, it's going to be taken out and you're not going to have any green sprouts come back forward. He's going to take care of it. And that green bay tree that Brother Bobby brought forward earlier, I like to think of as those green bay trees you see there and those pictures out in the west and out there in the, in the uh, Sahara Desert. Sometimes they have oasis where the tree grows out and and these big old uh, desert areas where the lions is roaming out in Africa. And, uh, you see this huge tree just sprawled out, a big old shade tree, and it happens to be just a, a little stream that runs right by it. And that thing spreads way out, and you think of how big that thing is, and that green bay tree taking up that much space. Think about that and how that, that is now done away with because the Lord takes care of the wicked and he'll take care of that. Um, I just like to think about it. But our opening text here, it says the grass withereth, a lot like that is done away with, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. This is in the verse right before. It goes in description of what it's describing there in verse 8, our opening text. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Brothers and sisters, when you see the wind blowing in the field, it's interesting to see some of those dandelions or those little flowers and see those petals just start blowing across or the grain to start blowing in the wind or you see uh, tumbleweeds in certain areas of the country where they're blowing across the field and you see all the grass, the dead grass and the weeds and all that all uh, jumbled up in those tumbleweeds and they're just blowing out across the fields and something else to see uh, when you go uh, drive down through the roads and the highways and you find that uh, these old fields where they're growing uh, the grass or uh, wheat and they're growing sometimes corn uh, in those seasons when the, the flower, the bloom of whatever it's growing blooms and it's so beautiful when it's at its peak. But then all of a sudden it starts dying off uh, pretty quickly. And when it starts dying off and, and when it starts getting yellowed and it starts uh, withering away, it's such a sad sight. It's always a real sad sight to see. 
especially cornfields up near our house. Uh, you'll pass by those cornfields. It looks so lush and so green and so beautiful. And you see the corns on, uh, you know, uh, the corn cobs and the silk uh, there hanging upon the stalks. And it's so beautiful, but then all of a sudden it starts wilting away. Uh, how sad it is sometimes, but yet you see it's harvest time and you see that it's time that that it wilts away. Brothers and sisters, isn't that the way it is that when we have been born again by the Holy Ghost and that, that is lively inside of us that we have life, that this old flesh, it dies off, don't it? Because of the sin nature, it dies off. Because of uh, what we inherited from Adam and Eve, uh, it dies off. But the spirit that is inside of us, that which has been quickened by the Holy Ghost, it lives on to be with God. This old flesh one day is going to be resurrected and made perfect and just right. And be joined together with our Holy Spirit, our, our spirit in glory. It's going to be just right. But when that spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. You think about what it's saying here. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people's grass. It gets weak. It gets wearisome. It gets to be something pretty pitiful. I'd like to, for you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Forgive me, I apologize. I had jotted down this. That was the uh, James 1. I, I mentioned uh, 1 Peter 1. That was James 1. I got my book wrong. Forgive me. But the next one I want to share with you, I want to share with you 1 Peter 1 also. But James 1, is it describes also what I'm talking about. It describes how that it passes away and how our glory passes away. It shows that, but it withereth the grass, talking about the burning heat, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishing. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. How often do we think that the rich man or the man of this old flesh trusts in the riches of this old life? We trust in riches, we trust in money, we trust in all these things naturally, but that isn't what saves us. That's not what gives us spiritual life. That's not what gives us a heavenly home. You remember uh, that the uh, Lazarus and the rich man when Lazarus, the poor man that was outside, uh, do you remember that time that that rich man there had not taken care of that man that was begging for food and didn't care about him? And you remember in his riches and in all his glory and all that he had that he despised him, he didn't care about him? Uh, and let me tell you, where was he later? He was in hell. Uh, he was in hell. Uh, he was in torment. Uh, let me tell you, uh, there was a time when uh, we, as God's people, are poor in this old world. Uh, we don't have much in this world. We're not given much in this world. We don't have all the wonderful the riches of this world. Uh, but let me tell you what we do have. We have riches that these riches in this world cannot buy. It's greater riches uh, that we have uh, to look forward to. It's a heavenly home that we have. My dear friends, let me tell you, God's been good to us in a mighty way. Uh, but yet, we look unto the beggarly things of this world instead of looking unto the things of God. 
Uh, brothers and sisters, how many times have we looked unto those beggarly things? Now to the first Peter chapter one that I was talking about. Forgive me for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth and the flower thereof faileth, falleth away. Now notice it goes in detail also to describe what it is talking about, about the grass and the flower. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower. Think of this. The grass is like the flesh. It's, it's the main stalk that comes up. But the flowers that bloom, it's the prettier part of that, whatever's growing. What's being represented here is the grass and the flower. My daughter loves these kind of flowers to go out and pick those weeds and those flowers and the blooms that grow on top. And she just loves to bring them in and Benjamin does too to mama. And then over time you see them things wilt and turn yellow and brown and all kinds of colors and fall over and they look pretty pitiful. But when they're fresh, oh how nice they look. But you think about the glory of man and how often sometimes that our glory is like that grass, that bloom on that grass. It blooms only for a season, a short period of time. Our glory is just as feeble as it. And as it blooms and our glory looks so wonderful and magnificent in other people's eyes just as our bloom blooms and flower looks beautiful it starts dying and withering away even if you don't pick it haven't you seen some of those blooms only for a short period of time they bloom and then all of a sudden birds come by and pluck it up or animals come by uh, We've got cats that it likes to go out and nibble those things off the tops. And you see all kinds of little creatures uh, polluting that little bloom. How often is our glory polluted by the things of this old world in a constant daily thing? It blooms only for a short season. And it's nothing. It's nothing but brown. It's nothing but wilt. It's nothing but death. And you think of, I've worked and I've labored and I've gotten all this to myself, yet it's nothing but like that flower. Is. You think I'm all this, I'm all that. I've I've got a good name out here. I've done all this. God blessed me in this, this, and this. But then you look to yourself for all the glory that you have had. And you think, well, look at what all I've got. Yet when God looks at it, it's nothing but just nothing. It's just a vapor. And the whole scheme of things, if a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day, and our life in, on this earth is only less than a hundred years, or even at a hundred years, you think it's absolutely nothing in comparison to eternity, which our Heavenly Father is in eternity. God is in eternity. We have a heavenly home one day that's in eternity. All righteousness, and it was said earlier, all righteousness that we have is through the work of Jesus Christ our Lord and through the life that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, lives on this earth. Amen. He has a righteousness, he has a glory that is everlasting. His glory doesn't die, it's always there. You think about what he's done, uh, and the life that he lived, it still has impact and it, it will continue to have an impact and a life-changing effect upon God's people till this old world has been done away with 
and we'll still be able to rejoice and enjoy all that he has done for us when we're in glory one day. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a glory that lasts, isn't it? Yet our glory doesn't last like that. Our parents can build up some kind of a uh, fun for children, uh, our grandchildren, and we sit and we maul and we worry about uh, making sure that we leave, leave a legacy for our children and our grandchildren. You say, Brother Brad, doesn't the Bible teach to store up for our children? Yes, the Bible does teach to store up for the children, but you know what's even more so? To give unto the Lord and to do according to God's word. It's greater than even to the natural thing in this life. To live unto the Lord and to spend our time serving him is greater than anything. The Bible teaches if you live, you live unto the Lord. You die. You die unto the Lord. Yet we don't think of it that way, do we? I enjoy it. When my wife reminds me of that, that we're supposed to be living unto the Lord, not unto ourselves, that scripture comes to mind. I ran across that this morning. Live un they that live, they live unto the Lord. They that die, die unto the Lord. I want to die in the, in the Lord when I die, but I pray it's no time soon. I don't think anybody wishes that on anybody or wants it, right? I'm a little selfish. I, I hope and pray that I can live a long, healthy life and Trina and I grow old together and be able to see my grandchildren one day. I hope and pray God can be merciful and help this country to continue, especially the New Testament church. That they don't have it so bad. We ought to be praying such things. But how wonderful how God will, as one flower uh, falleth away, God sends up new flowers. And later on, in the next year to come, sometimes it's seasons. Sometimes it bloom twice in a year. Wouldn't, isn't that wonderful that how God has designed it to happen that way, that as one fades away, God sends another to come in its place. And as it fades away, God raises another. You know, the church is like that. God sends men of God into the church. As one comes along, God blesses and, and moves that man of God unto another place and brings another one in. Uh, and members the same way. As God blesses those members to grow and some fade away, uh, whether it be long time there or they move away, God sends more later on. We need to be praying. Be thankful. We want everything to stay just the same and be just perfect and just the way it is comfortable. But God's word doesn't teach it always that way, does it? Except God's word. God's word is unchanging. This whole life changes on a constant basis. It's painful to change. Growing pains is painful for children. The same way with anything growing in this life, it changes. You watch anything grow, you watch trees grow, it changes. It changes. But our opening text, back to our opening text in Isaiah 40, We've looked at the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Why does it say that? Why does it say, but the word of our God shall stand forever when it just gets done talking about grass and a flower? We went into the descriptions of what it's talking about, that grass being as the flesh and the flower being as the glory of man. Now, notice, 
that if the, uh, if the grass, my dear friends, withereth and the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That means that God's word is unchanging. It, uh, it's going to stand. God preserves his word. God has preserved his word. It's infallible. It's inspired. And it's unchangeable. No matter how much man thinks that they can change it or cause doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> Last Sunday I had uh, touched on something. I didn't get to spend a lot of time on it because I had a lot to cover. You know, you go home and you think, man, I wish I had said this. Well, that's the life of a preacher. But you know, our, our articles of faith, we believe that the KJV, that the Word of God is our only rule of faith and practice, both Old Testament and New Testament. We believe that. It's very important. And with that on also said, we also believe that is the inspired, infallible Word of God. Now, I had just touched on just a slither of this, but think about this, that we have had people that have tried to do away with the Word of God throughout the ages. They have tried to crucify. They have tried to kill. They have tried to destroy men of God. They have tried to kill off our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, they have tried to kill the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. You remember in the beginning was the Word, and Word was God, and was with God. Jesus Christ was with God, the Father, in the beginning. Yet he is also what has given us the Word of God. Through his own words that was preached that was taught. His words line up with the prophets at many occasions. And that which was prophesied of Jesus Christ was right in line with what the Lord Jesus Christ had preached on in many occasions. Different things that was to come happened just as the prophets had told it to happen earlier in the Old Testament scriptures. God will and has always pre preserved his word. It will stand always. You said, Brother Brad, well, what about the Bibles there in other countries and other languages? We're talking about English. I believe it is the inspired word of God. The KJV is the inspired word of God. That that is founded back to the 1611. I believe that God had his hand upon King James in a mighty way. And blessed him to be able to bring it forth in English. For God's people to be able to read. <clears throat> we believe that for a reason. Because it stands. The Lord blessed me one day to preach on <clears throat> the subject of the KJB. I will do so. But we're touching on this in this in the light of this scripture that we opened up with. Now think about this. Nowhere else, no other so-called perversion of scripture has ever been sought out to be destroyed in any fashion in which they have tried to seek out to destroy the KJV. Why is that? Because I believe God's almighty hand was upon King James when he sought out to clarify things. When you go back and do history, in which King James had tried to have this made up uh, in a nice English tongue. 
fixed in a nice English tongue so that people in English could read it and understand it. Before then, there were so many different kinds of perversions out there, he was sick of it. It's a lot like today, about 400 some years ago, uh, they had so many perversions out there, it was vast confusion among the land. They couldn't hardly see straight or understand what was being taught in all the different churches. You've got to understand uh, that uh, what the ministers was preaching from out of their churches uh, wasn't the same kind of topics that they could go home and read. So King James had had enough of it. And he wanted it simplified in the truth. You say simplified. Well, wants the truth. Not so many different versions of perversion, so to speak out there confusing people and the common man be able to have it and take it home and to read it. That's the way the word of God teaches that we're to read his word. To look to his word. It wasn't just to be preached out of and nobody be able to read it but God's people, that's everybody. The laity, the ministry, everybody. And that it be preached. Isn't that comforting to know that God has been so good to provide us his word in such a way as that? Now, <clears throat> what did you think back in Genesis when Eve and Adam was being deceived. The serpent deceived them what? By twisting scripture. By twisting God's word. By twisting it and deceiving them. How are people today trying to deceive God's people? By making perversions, by changing scripture, mm -hmm. by adding and taking away which the last chapter of Revelation teaches us of what will happen by adding to and taking away from. Yeah. The other text that these perversions uh, come from they have uh, taken out many key portions of scripture out of the Bible for a reason. To make people question the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's serious. The Bible teaches us to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. Be able to understand how the Lean upon God's word. Lean upon the work of the Holy Ghost. Lean upon what God's given us to understand uh, his word. You know, the Holy Spirit is in, is in perfect agreement with the word of God. When children of God has been saved by grace and grace alone and not by our own righteousness and because it's through the work that God knew us before the foundation of the world and because Jesus Christ came to die upon the cross at Calvary to live the righteous and upright life that we could not live, go to Calvary and die on the cross for our sins and be raised again after the third day, and that the work of the Holy Ghost has quickened us, and we have been born again by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that be, be children of God. My dear friends, let me tell you, <clears throat> when they qu cause questions about the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that causes everything to be thrown out in disarray. Now, does that mean that the deity is no longer there? No. That means that man is trying to destroy in the minds of God's people 
Satan is working through men to destroy what they understand about the deity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To cause doubt to make you not believe. And when you understand that Jesus doesn't just fade away and he don't just wither away, that he's real and he's alive. Yeah. And he's at the right hand of God. And that he lives. When you understand that, brothers and sisters, it blows all that other perversions out of the water. And it shows just how feeble we are and not because of our righteousness, not because of our glory, not because of our abilities, not because of all the things that we have done, not because of our life, not because of any of that. But it's only by the grace of God. Amen. Because we fade away, we wither away. Everything that we produce, it dies. Can a clean thing come from that which is unclean? Scripture teaches. Can anything clean come from that which is unclean? No. If we're unclean, all that we can produce is unclean. But that which is clean is able to produce clean. That's why... Joseph was not the father of Jesus Christ because Jesus would be unclean. That's what man wants you to question. That's what Satan wants you to question. The deity. Satan wants you to question uh, just how Jesus came about. Uh, Satan wants you to think that he's just some kind of prophet out there. Satan wants you to think that he didn't raise again after the third day. Satan wants you to think that he's not really the son of God. My dear friends, guess what? That's why all this other perversion takes so much out of the word of God. Uh, that's why the King James Version has been blessed in such a way in the English tongue to be the inspired word of God. It's infallible. Why? Because God preserved it. His word will be always preserved. No man, no matter what they try to do, will be able to take away his word. His word always stands. The bad part we've got is we hear this and that all over creation out here. And when we study this and we study that, sometimes we get so confused <coughs> in our studies that we're not thinking about the simplicity of the word of God. The simplicity of belief or unbelief. The simplicity in believing God's word, which our opening text. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Do you believe it or not believe it? When we start thinking that we have to start changing the word of God to fit and bring it down to our level of understanding, we have failed. If you think that, you better think that you need to change your way of thinking to fit the word of God and understand the word of God because it, that's all there is to it. Either God is right and you are wrong. God is true or you are a liar. Do you believe it or not believe it? It's real simple. Yet man has made it very difficult to understand, very confusing. Bible scholarships, Bible colleges have made it very difficult for people to understand. It doesn't have to be that hard. 
That's why we don't believe in our ministers going to a Bible college. We believe, as the New Testament scripture teaches, to labor under an older ministry for a while. Apostle Paul was three years laboring and waiting before he went out. There's others that may have been sooner than that. Others that were longer than that. Brothers and sisters, if you look back upon how long it was before I was ordained a gospel minister or how long it was before I was licensed, it was quite a while. But that's more time to grow. But I'll say this. There's people out there that will make it a very theological, very deep conversation of technicalities of why they believe the KJV is an inspired word. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be that difficult. It doesn't have to be that difficult. You can just look. If you just stand back just a little while and just look, and how the, the KJV has stood the test of time for 400 plus years. And that men have tried everything they can to destroy and to do away with. Yet God has preserved his word in English by the KJV. Is that not powerful? That God used a king way back to help. You'll find in scripture, it goes right along in scripture, when King Cyrus, you know, they keep referring that Trump is like King Cyrus, that when King Cyrus was used, nobody would have ever dreamed that that man would be used by God, but God used that man. No man would have ever thought back in the 1980s and 1990s that President Trump would be our president of the United States of America. I would have never dreamed it. But I will say this. I have seen change in that man while he's been in office. I believe God has gotten a hold of him and used him in a mighty way. How often has God used men in authority in whatever way in this life for his own purpose? That's not that God has been fatalistic. The only thing predestinated is our eternal salvation. Us being his children, we have been predestinated. But when it comes to our day-to-day -day lives, God does guide us and help us through his providential hand. That's a guide. Like a father guides a child. He guides you. He directs you. He helps you with this guiding. He doesn't have to. He can sometimes back away. But just as with my children, I help guide them, help them, strengthen them when they need some help and strength. I will help them and, and provide for them. God provides for his children. His word teaches he provides for us. But just because things always happen or seems like God's in the matter does not mean he predestinated it to happen. Or it was faith. It was he provided. But God has preserved his word. And his word will always stand. And it's not going to be based upon man's abilities 
or inabilities. It wasn't based upon his abilities or inabilities. It wasn't based upon all these other people. But because God's providential hand was in the matter, he provided for them, helped them, strengthened them. And my dear friends, and because God was in the matter, and just as when Jesus Christ was here on this earth, and as he lived in accordance to his heavenly Father, uh, as he ought to live, uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, Men hated it. Satan hated it. And you remember there that in Matthew chapter 4, when uh, Jesus Christ had been led up into the mount to be tempted of Satan himself, he said, God can't be tempted. No, let me tell you, he can overcome that temptation. And my dear friends, where we're weak in this old flesh, oh, we fall. Uh, to temptation a lot of times but God makes a way uh, that we may be able to escape uh, but brothers and sisters we don't always look to Jesus Christ our Lord we don't look to God the Father we don't look at praying and being in fellowship with the Holy Ghost that dwells inside of us and how in communion with him sometimes uh, we fall away sometimes we fall away to temptation but Jesus Christ is perfect when that temptation comes when Satan tempted him. Let me tell you, he rejected it. He rebuked it to the face. He rebuked Satan to his face. When Satan was trying to take scripture and manipulate it and to turn it around and to show him what kind of glory and what kind of power he could give him on this earth. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ turned it all down. Because he had greater things. When he was a hungered in this old flesh, Satan took the bread and tempted him with bread and said, Turn this stone to bread. And Jesus Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone. When you get to thinking that you need all this and all that, and you need all this food and you need all these things, Satan uses all those things to tempt you, to draw you away from the things of God and living by faith and living for the Lord. He takes your own necessities and he'll use your own necessities to tempt you, to make you think, hey, I need this so much for my family, for me to live and cause you to think, well, I'm just, if I don't do this, this is gonna happen. No, sometimes we need to continue Trusting God will provide. Being down upon our knees, praying, Lord, let your will be done, not mine. Help me, strengthen me. Help me look to your word. Help me rely upon you. Because how many times is it that we get to a point where we just get so weak, we get so feeble, we get so exhausted, we get so worn. But yet, because Jesus lives, because Jesus reigns, because of his righteousness, we're righteous in the eyes of God. Because of his righteousness and what he done for us. Isn't that comforting? Especially when we look at this scripture here in our opening text, and I'll read this. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me look at this real quick. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Like as the father, a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth, for the wind passeth over, 
and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant and to... <clears throat> to keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Psalms 103, 12 through 19. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you how great is our God and how good has he been unto us. He's been so great and so good. His righteousness all, always Everlasting to everlasting, it never fades away, his righteousness. Ours does. But not only that, in our opening text of Isaiah 4, 40, remember there in the very last portion, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We need to be resting in that and what he's given us. It's not based upon our own abilities. based clearly upon what he has done for us and his word that God has given us to be able to read and to stand on his word. Thank you for your time, your kind, sweet attention. Continue to keep us in your prayers. Amen.